It is 940, Wednesday, July 1st. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News and to our resident Met fan, John Green. Happy Bobby Bonilla Day. Oh, every day is happy Bobby Bonilla Day. This is really the day. He gets paid today. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. I'm Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. And yes, the new look. Finally couldn't take it. No barbershops open. Just got out the clippers. Here I am. Jonathan Green, general manager from DJ Stable. And you guys don't realize that you are in the presence of greatness. I was I'm fortunate enough to break new ground into the thoroughbred industry by being the first Fajic Tipton online buyer to buy a horse. So now my name will be up there in the rafters with Neil Armstrong, Ferdinand Magellan, and Sputnik. <laughs> Uh, Brian Dinato, racing editor at the TDN and managing partner of Franklin Ave Equine. And I only have three words for Bill Harvey's Lil Goyle. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that, my friend. <laughs> uh, this is a warning ahead of time. We'll have 10 minutes at Harvey's Lil Goyle. Uh, we'll at, least, at least. At least. Um, <laughs> Bill's looking like his, his Marine days right now. Looking right, sharp. Yeah. <laughs> TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. A reminder that wagering through Keeneland Select supports Keeneland's efforts to give back to the thoroughbred industry as profits are reinvested back into the sport through purses, fan development, player rewards, and more. Sign up at KeenelandSelect.com. So Keeneland, after having their sale, their most recent sale wrap up, is going to get back into the racing game next weekend. Uh, they have their five-day boutique meet, the summer meet coming up, and that's going to be super exciting, high-quality racing. Uh, the, the meat of the of the of the meat of the meat is going to be July 10th, 11th, and 12th. You got the Makers Mark Mile next Friday, July 10th. A bunch of great ones on Saturday: the Ashland, the Jenny Wiley, the Madison. Uh, we also have the Bluegrass that day, um, and then the, the Transylvania and the Elkhorn are Sunday. So it's going to be a lot of great Keelan action condensed into five days, really three days of really great stakes action. Uh, looking forward to that. I don't know if John is pointing anybody or knows anybody that's pointing anybody. Yep, friend of the show, Blue Buff, is supposed to run into starter allowance on closing day at Keeneland. We wow. actually shipped them, up, we shipped them up north just for that race. I heard Maximum hey, Security is pointing for that race too, John. He might be eligible still, yes, that's true. <laughs> Come back for Bafford, there you go. <laughs> we'll finally decide who is the best former 16,000 claimer in the land. Exactly, the gloves are off, absolutely. Now, ours is a, what's nice is ours is a Kentucky bread, so you get, you get I think it's like a $70,000 purse plus KTDF and, and everything like that. Um, but no, it's going to be fun to watch them showcase you know, at Keeneland, and uh, the breeders are actually going to come out and, and represent us, which is really cool. All right, so big weekend of racing. All the stars were out uh, pretty much across the land. Um, I would say the headliner is not one of my favorite horses, but one of a lot of people's favorite horses is a newspaper of record. Uh, she won the Just the Game wire to wire, got a 105 fire speed figure. I guess you could say the co headliner is, Mid is uh, Tom Theta and Midnight Bizu. I think they kind of did what was what were expected of them, especially Midnight Bizu. Tom Zaytal got a 109 buyer, so that's that's pretty huge, especially for a horse that's in his seven year old year now. So he seems to be the pretty clear leader in the handicap division. Um, seems to be going to the Whitney next, and then the Breeders' Cup. Uh, Midnight Bizu, Bill did some reporting, and it seems like the Breeders' Cup Classic is at least on the radar for her, which would be cool. She's already run well against the boys once in the Saudi Cup. Might end up being the winner of the Saudi Cup. Who knows? Um, a couple other uh, results at Belmont. Forenze Fire back to back to his better form for Kelly Breen after not running well first time out for, out of the Jason Service barn. Uh, we'll just go around and we're, we'll talk about what stood out to us the most. I know it's going to be Harvey's little goal, goal for Brian, but uh, it'll start with you. Oh, of course it was Harvey's little girl was the highlight of the weekend. Uh, if many of you remember back, oh, I don't know, in February or March, Brian and I kind of went at one another about he had her being um, – uh, higher rated than, than I did. So anyways, congratulations to her on the grass. And uh, she did it. Boy, Joe, I, I don't even know where to start because it was another second great weekend in a row after the Belmont weekend of having you know really good races and really good horses. I mean, newspaper of record, she's back to her two-year-old form when she was outstanding. What happened to her as a three-year-old? I don't know. Uh, now, the only caveat I would put on her performance in the Just a Game is that Uni didn't really show up. Um, she was kind of dull in that race. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. I believe she was third in there. So, you know, maybe uh, on paper, the race looked a little harder than it was in actuality. But take nothing away from her. And it's going to be really interesting to see how um, 
Chad Brown manages his grass fillies going forward because he has newspaper of record, Uni and Sister Charlie coming back. I mean, those are three fantastic horses in there. And um, he talked about running a newspaper of record against uh, males. So maybe the four star Dave at Saratoga, something like that, um, you know, because he said there's not a lot of uh, medium distance, like mile races for fillies on the grass. Tom Satat did exactly what we had expected. Very good. Uh, in the Stephen Foster. And, uh, you know, the Midnight Beast story is very interesting. You know, she didn't prove a whole lot in the uh, Florida League. She just manhandled uh, a, a pretty much inferior opponents. I was a little disappointed in Serengeti Empress didn't run better. And I think it'll be really cool to see what they do. Um, this is just my guess, and I have nothing to base this on other than sort of my intuition. I think she will run in the Classic. Because, look, these guys have already gone all the way to Saudi Arabia to run against males. So, obviously, Bloom Racing and, and the other partners are pretty game. Um, you know, they don't always take the careful route. So, we'll keep an eye on that and uh, another great weekend of racing. Yeah, I just want to focus on on Newspaper of Record because, you know, we talked about her a couple of shows ago. I believe she won on June 6th. Um, and then about, you know, three weeks later, came back and won a grade one pretty, I think, was impressively. And the, and the knock on her at the time was, and rightfully so, was, well, she really excels on a yielding turf course. Um, and on a fast turf course or a firm turf course, technically, um, she hasn't shown her best. And it really looks like that, you know, I hate to say you can cross out an entire year because that's not really fair. Um, but you almost have to, to look at her and say last year was an anomaly because her two year old year was phenomenal. This year, it looks like she's really back into form. And I think they found the right distances for her, um, you know, for her to excel in. So, you know, you have to give her her due. Um, newspaper of record, I really feel like that she's rounding out into shape and that as long as they keep her at the right distances, which looks like more on the sprinting type side, maybe, you know, a little bit elongated sprint, um, that she's very tough to beat um, in those races. So tip of the hat to newspaper of record. Um, I, I dare say she's back but that's been overused. Um, Monomoy girl, you know, it looks like she's going to have a, 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 a setup now with, uh, God, you, you mean know, midnight Bisu, my no, friend. With, with, with midnight Bisu. Yeah, no, what I was going to okay, say is yeah. Monomoy girl is setting up to, to, okay. to run in right. a couple of weeks and she's going to thank you. She's going to run against midnight Bisu. Um, and you know, I really hope that those two go head to head because not only is it going to be, you know, great for racing, but it's really wonderful that these two older mares are back. Um, and they're both running, you know, hopefully to the, to the, uh, extending part of their of their careers um whether or not either of them run against the boys um that's just bonus for us as as racing fans but i'm really looking forward to uh watching them hook up sometime this summer and uh, to see you know who the top um this staff philly and mayor is at this point yeah um i mean you guys covered a lot there going back to newspaper record i have to think the woodbine mile would be a great spot for her a one-turn mile basically you know just like the race she ran in uh, this weekend. Uh, I'm not sure if they've mentioned that or if they're thinking about it, but that seems like a good spot uh, to take on the boys. Um, I'll wait. I'll, I'll go through some other ones before we get to Harvey's little goal. I thought Tom's day time. I mean, he, to run his career it. best. He's, he's, he's milking it. He's milking it. <laughs> I don't even like, like, the, I don't even like the horse that much, but we'll get to it. Um, Tom's day top 109 buyer at, at, you know, age seven or whatever he is really impressive. Um, I was happy for Miguel Mena. He got a lot of, you know, people were kind of trashing him before the race and, that, and wondering why he was on the horse. Um, he rides a lot for Al Stahl. He's a solid rider. I mean, he's not, you know, a top 10 rider, but he's a good rider and, and he rides for us a lot. And I thought it was kind of a little ridiculous to, for people to think he was going to, you know, blow the ride on that horse. Is that why he did he the... Kinda, yeah, that yeah, he did yeah that? exactly. Yeah, people were, uh, everyone was questioning, you know, how do you get on this horse and, and stuff? And it's ridiculous. But I mean, he was kind of just a passenger, but, you know, yeah. he did what he had to do. Um, I mean, there were a lot of interesting performances. It was a great weekend. Uh, Midnight Bisu, like you guys kind of alluded to, I'm not sure it was a superstar. You know, she ran a 94 buyer. You know, people were going a little crazy on Twitter after. I think someone somewhere called her the best horse in the world. And then everyone piled on that person. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is typically the case. On Twitter? Yeah, I wouldn't really go that far. Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far with her. She's a nice horse. It'll be interesting to see her back against the boys. Um, Harvey's a little goyle. I mean, we some of us saw it coming, you know. It's funny, another American pharaoh that, that took to the turf. I, you know, I kind of figured she'd improve with the turf. And she had a bad trip last time. Um, and I don't know why I've become like the poster boy for Harvey's little goyle fandom. I think I just felt like giving Bill a hard time that day. 
Um, but you know, it was sweet to see her win it nine to one or whatever it was. And she beat a good horse. I think that Graham horse is pretty good. She, yeah, she was impressive in her first U S start. So, I mean, she seems like a leader in the, you know, three-year-old turf Philly division at this point. No, Brian, I, just, I, I, gotta, I need to defend go. myself here. Okay. So the argument was, I think I had Harvey's little Goyle at seventh or eighth or something like that in my Kentucky Oaks top 10. And Brian just trashed me. I mean, bit me a new one, et cetera. I will go on record now saying, yes, I did make a mistake. I overrated her. She's not the Ooh. top eight for the Kentucky Oaks. She's not even in the Kentucky Oaks picture. She's gone on. She couldn't get it done in, in dirt competition. And now as a grass horse, I wish her well. But unless I miss the press release from the uh, Churchill Downs, the Kentucky Oaks has been moved to grass, then I was, if anything, I overrated her. So, and a matter of fact, on top of <laughs> that, I picked the damn horse in the race on Saturday. So I was on the Harvey oh, Slip cool. bandwagon on the grass. And it is, again, what is it with the American pharaohs are so good on the grass? That, that's a, another side subject. But anyway, shame on me for overrating <laughs> Harvey's little Goyle. So, uh, and when she wins the Arc de Triomphe next year as a four-year-old, then, <laughs> then and only then will I let Brian quote, quote again. Bill, is it, is hey, it true sure. that that's why you basically shaved your head? It, because you said if, if she wins another graded steak race, I'm going to shave my head. Is that, is that <laughs> absolutely? Yes. Okay. I had a side All bet right. with Brian on that. Yeah. Because I want to shave the beard. He didn't. So, yeah, we'll have to do a, a shave the beard bet. That would be great. I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'll do anything not to lose that one. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I will say, turf horses do take to, to Churchill Downs, the, the dirt track. So, I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if they get creative or go back to the dirt at some point and maybe consider it. So I guess we'll see. Now that we've explored all the harvest, that was, that was, that was an interesting <laughs> way to wriggle out of that one, Bill, that you overrated. <laughs> that was good. I like that. Who, who is this horse? You know? he, do, he doubled down. He doubled down on that one. I yeah, think we talked about, we talked more about that Philly than the owners even do. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So I'm going to be the turn the punch ball once again on newspaper of record. Obviously, she she looked good. She got a she got a big buyer figure, but on a one term mile going twenty three and four forty eight flat, like to me, that's what a good horse is supposed to do. Like Bill said, I don't think Mooney ran her race. I just I don't know. I'm never going to be fans of those one dimensional speed horses. Like if she if she gets pushed on the lead, I don't think she's the same horse going two turns. I don't think she's the same horse. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see how they manage her the rest of the way because, like you guys said, there's not a lot of one mile. Uh, turf races for Phillies, Woodbine Mile makes sense. Um, Breeders' Cut Mile makes sense. And like, if you if another speed horse shows up and she really has to work hard and put away the speed, and then still does that, then I'll be impressed. But I don't know. She's just she had everything her own way. You know, it's just I'm I'm never going to be impressed by horses like that. Another, another horse that had everything her own way. It's just it, it kills me to watch these races. It was Mean Mary in the New York. I mean, I just. This is like trauma from my youth of watching these races at Belmont going 51 and 115 and just the race is over a quarter mile, half mile into the race like that. That kills me, man. And I don't know, especially with the way she got bad. It just it, it rubbed me the wrong way. She's obviously a nice horse, but I don't know. It just it takes away from the competition of, of the race to me to have just a horse crawling along on the lead like that. You, you know what's going to happen. It's a foregone conclusion. Um, so I just. We're having a little too much fun. I had to bring it down a little bit. I just wasn't wasn't a fan of those two performances. Newspaper record is obviously very talented, but I don't know. I wouldn't run the full page ad yet, John. I gotta see. I gotta see her get into a tussle and 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 survive that. She just she had everything her own way. The problem yeah, with and that I'm, is that I'm not necessarily sure that 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 she's a you know she's a superstar in the Hall of Fame type filly. I'm not saying that, but certainly whatever whatever was going wrong for her as a three year old. Chad Brown has done a very nice job of figuring it out and making her um, into a better four-year-old. That being said, part of, of being a good trainer and a big and a, being a good owner is being a good manager and recognizing, you know, where there are some opportunities. It was still a grade one. And I know that, that Uni was really the only competition in the race and, and Uni did not put in her A game that, that race. Um, but whenever a horse wins a grade one, especially having done it before, you have to recognize that there's some talent there. This was not an overnight allowance race that they were making go, um, you know, for her. And they put in a bunch of claimers. This was actually, a, a, you know, a grade one race that will still earn a grade one next year. So, it, you know, you have to recognize that, that she's, she's very good. Um, is she going to be a superstar going a mile and 16th or a mile and an eighth on the, on the turf? Probably not. Not a grade one level against older Phillies. But for what she is, she's very good. She's almost like a Mike Stanton type 
course where, you know, you go in, you throw Mike Stan in there to, to, to get out a certain hitter and then you bring them out of the, you know, you bring them out of the game and, and you let the other bullpen guys finish the game off um, for you Yankee fans out there. Um, you know, he's a loogie is what is what she is. OK, she's a, a left handed relief, uh, you know, uh, lefty, lefty, lefty hitter. That was a deep cut. <laughs> and I almost got through it without screwing up. Brian and uh, Chad, I mean, Chad probably has the next I, I couldn't even name him, but like he probably has the next five best Philly turf milers. So he kind of just has like a monopoly on those sorts of divisions. I'm sure he'll pick his spots and all that. And she kind of reminds me a little bit of Bobby's kitten. Um, he was kind of like a runoff two-year-old, I think, if I remember correctly. You know, really brilliant turf two-year-old, kind of like him. Then he kind of went off form, and then he cut back, and I, he won the Breeders' Cup turf sprint down the hill. Um, so, I, I don't know, just kind of – and I think he went over to Europe and did some – and and now he stands over there, but uh, just kind of a similar horse. And you don't really see horses like that from a lot of barns that – do well and then kind of come back later, but it's it's Chad. I mean, she's uh, she's obviously super talented. I just it, it seems like she's been set up by really cushy circumstances in these two races. More so, I think even this past week. I think in the Intercontinental, she at least had to run pretty fast to get to the lead. But I mean, twenty three and four forty eight is crawling for Grade One horses on the turf. Um, so I just that and the Mean Mary race just kind of rubbed me the wrong way, and I couldn't get too excited about it. But you know. It still was a phenomenal weekend of racing, and and I was very excited about Newspaper Record as a two-year-old. No disrespect to John Green, but I thought there was an argument to make her champion two-year-old that two-year-old filly that year. I think ultimately they did make the right decision because the juvenile fillies is a bigger race than the juvenile fillies turf. But I just thought with how impressive she was, she at least had an argument. So it's it's good in that way to see her getting back to her top form. But I just I want to see her fight. You know what I mean? I don't want to just see her loping along on the front end like that's not exciting to me. Right. And, and Joe, you're you're a thousand percent correct. We we were very worried that you know it seemed like every year when the two year old uh, you know Philly Eclipse Award comes out, um, it goes to the the horse that won the dirt race. And there was uh, definitely you know a lot of people who were clamoring for you know this to be the the, the year that it changed where there was a turf horse. Um, the voting didn't play out that way, obviously, but but we were concerned going into the uh, the event that night for sure. All right, so not quite the weekend we had last week uh, in terms of star power, but there is some really good racing this weekend. Uh, on Saturday, there's a big card at Belmont, the July 4th card. They have, we have the Run Happy Metropolitan Handicap. Um, always, I, I always, I've said this before, but I always loved having the Met be a centerpiece on its own card. I hated when they moved it to be a Belmont undercard race. So that's going to happen again this year. That's going to go back, revert back to it being the centerpiece race this year. Uh, pretty good looking field. I think that the two headliners are going to be Vacoma and Code of Honor. Both won on the same card a couple weeks ago at Belmont. Vacoma, I think, is just super exciting. I think he's has a chance to be one of the best horses in the country, if not the best at a one turn mile at seven furlongs. Um, probably the best horse George Weaver might ever have. Um, Code of Honor, it's going to be interesting to see him. I think I actually liked him at going a mile last year. I thought his race in the Dwyer was was terrific. So that's an interesting race. Uh, Mr. Freeze might be in there as well. Hog Creek Hustle, ne- Network Effect, McKinsey. Um, we also have the Manhattan at Belmont. Doesn't seem like it's going to be a super great field. Um, a couple other races, the Victory Ride in the Suburban. A couple decent races at Delaware. They have their card with the Delaware Oaks and the Kent this weekend for three-year-olds. Uh, Los Alamitos has the Los Al Derby and the Great Lady M. Um, be interesting to see horses in there. I'm not going to talk about the Los Al Derby field because I might want to pick one of those horses later on in the, in the show for our supplemental draft. Uh, Bellafina might be in the Great Lady M. We got some, we got some good action overseas as well. We got the Epsom Derby. We have the uh, the Prita Diane, the Prita Jockey Club in France, and the Coral Eclipse Sunday. We will see the return of Enable, the Great Enable. Um, Thought we might see her at Royal Ascot, but instead she's going to run this Sunday. Um, looks like an okay field. Looks like there might be seven or eight horses challenging her. To me, that's a really exciting horse. You want to talk about horses to get excited about. Um, I think it's it's great that she's still running. She's going to try for a third arc later this year, theoretically after getting beat last year going for it. Um, so definitely going to set an alarm for that one. Um, anything you guys are particularly interested in this week that, that I may or may not have gotten to? Basically, the Los Alaminos race is is the the to me the most interesting because of the uh, the points that are going to be uh, you know offered for that for that race. 
Um, because even though we think that you have a lot of derby preps coming up, um, on the, on the West coast, there's only that one and the, uh, and the shared belief, and then everything moves East. So, um, there has to be, you know, quickly, there's going to have to be a thinning out of the, of the herd of the talent, um, out in California. And that's going to be a very important race when it comes to, uh, derby standings. Yeah. It's going to be a pretty short field, right? It, it looked like it from the, uh, probables, um, be five horses and four baffers. Right. Yeah. It seems like it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so, so a um, weekend. Yeah. yeah. Uh, back to the Matt Mile. I, I, McKenzie will be interesting. I know he, he made like a bit of, big middle move in the race last year. Um, and a lot of people thought he was best in that race. So it'll be interesting to see how he runs uh, shipping cross country. I, obviously, Bafford shipped another horse to go a mile at Belmont cross country and turned a pretty big performance recently in Gamine. So I wouldn't be surprised to see him on a big race. I'm curious to see how Enable runs, just to see how it sets up for her big matchup with Harvey's little Goyle at the end of the year. And, you know, <laughs> oh my God! Uh, turf for something. <laughs> Man, you slipped that one in there. Nice. <laughs> yeah. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. Owning multiple greatest stakes winning racehorses like Hard Not to Love or Decorated Invader is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Check out why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtb.com. So we had a, a big two-year-old sale wrap up this week. We got back into the two-year-old sale action with OBS Spring turn to June. Um, there's going to be the OBS July sale in a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk to Tom Ventura from OBS. We had Facing Mid-Atlantic yesterday and the day before. Um, seemed to me, you know, I'm not the, the biggest sale expert in the land, but seemed to me that the market was surprisingly good, that it bounced back, I think, quicker than most people thought, especially compared um, to OBS, which was a little, you know, touch and go. Uh, Brian and John picked up another good looking horse by Constitution, so congrats to you guys on that. Um, but I'll just, I'll, I'll toss it to, to John and then Brian, what were your impressions from facing Mid-Atlantic? Yeah, Joe, I think, I think you're, you're spot on. I mean, we were anticipating that it was going to be a really good buyer's market for this Maryland sale, um, based on the fact that, you know, people were still concerned about traveling and, and there wasn't, you know, going to be any international buyers, um, just like there weren't any for the, for the past OBS sale. What we found is that a lot of people actually drove in. Uh, a lot of trainers drove into town to, uh, you know, to look at horses and kind of kick tires. And just like you know, some of the other sales, the upper echelon, you know, went up, and the lower part of the of the of the sale, um, you know, was tough to to get them moved. Uh, but with the internet, the ability to, to bid on the internet, I think that really helped Phasic. I think they said in their release that about a dozen and a half horses actually changed hands due to the uh, advent of the, of the internet bidding. Um, so that was an interesting kind of twist to, to the thing. And, and, and again, just like the Keeneland horses of racing age sale last week, that's the new normal. That's going to be another outlet for people to have an opportunity to, to, to buy horses. Um, Brian, you can get into this a little bit better than, than I can, because you were actually there for the under tax show, but it seemed like that that racetrack, um, you know, was a little bit more forgiving than the OBS track, but it was certainly slower. I think it's always a tick or two slower. Uh, I mean, the configuration is a little different and all that. I always find it tougher. Watching works at OBS, I think all horses kind of look, there's like a tighter range. They all kind of look the same. I think on the dirt at phase, you kind of see a wider range um, just visually. Uh, but it seemed like the track was kind of the same every day and similar. You know, It's never going to be quite as quick. And it's such a tricky little configuration with the bull ring. As soon as the horses are going fast, they have to slow down again. Um, but yeah, general impressions. It was definitely a little tougher to buy a horse than I expected it to be. Um, we vetted maybe five. We only had one pass the vet and the horses that didn't pass were still pretty popular. Um, I think people were pretty forgiving of stuff, which sometimes you don't always see. Um, 
a lot of action for like the classic kind of Colts, uh, the horse we bought, the Constitution. I think there were probably, it seemed like there was kind of money coming in and all over for him. And I knew, I saw kind of a lot of prominent buyers walk into the ring, uh, follow him into the ring. So I think there were a lot of people uh, looking at him. Um, it was pretty crowded. You kind of saw everybody that you would have expected to see at a sale. I don't think, you know, it was more crowded than I expected. Um, they did a good job with the protocols when you came in. Uh, they took your temperature and took your name and phone number down. And you had like a wristband. Um, I'd say it was probably outside. It was maybe 50, 50 for mask wearers inside. It was higher. Um, I think they had some problems getting people. They really were strongly recommending people wear masks inside. And I think there were some people who just were not having it. Um, so they made a couple of announcements kind of, you know, pleading with the people to put masks on inside. But uh, for the most part, I thought that part went well and people seemed pretty cognizant of, you know, not shaking hands and that kind of thing and keeping distance, which I think was good. And hopefully that gives people a little more, you know, makes people more comfortable heading into the yearling sales and that kind of thing. And people are kind of, everyone kind of knows the deal now and knows how to act. And it was kind of weird. That was the first time I'd been out really like out anywhere other than the grocery store since all this stuff started. So it was, I didn't even really know how to act, you know, like went to a restaurant, didn't know like the protocols and stuff. So it was a learning experience for me, but I'm sure most people have been outside more than I have in the last few months. You're doing that before Corona anyway. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but now that mask thing annoys me. I'm, I, I might say something about it later. We're talking about the Derby thing, but also I, I didn't see what it was yesterday, but I saw that the RNA rate on day one was only like 24%, which seems super low to me. I think at OBS, it was much higher. Um, so I guess that that means people are, are having more confidence in the market. Like, I don't know, maybe I'm off on that, but what do you think? No, I think I think you're spot on, Joe. I think what happened was a lot of people came in now that these racetracks are opening up um, in Delaware and, and West Virginia and, and obviously New York, New Jersey and, and, and the outline, you know, Maryland, the, the outlying rate, um, states, excuse me. Um, there is a need for inventory. So there were a lot of people there who were buying horses for you know, the 25 to 30 range with the with the hopes that they can you know, run them in a couple of months. Um, you know, for the maiden 30 or maiden 40, because those races are, are going to be written a lot, um, a lot more often as, as the uh, next couple of weeks unveil um, or unfurl, I should say. Um, it, you know, but there, there was a strength of market, I thought, that surprised me. Um, strength of market throughout the entire, you know, group of horses. Bad horses weren't going to sell. Horses that didn't vet weren't going to sell. But if you had a horse that was relatively clean, um, no matter what the talent level, it, it looked like there was a marketplace and a home for it, which I don't think, you know, I would feel confident in saying for the, the past couple of sales, um, you know, the past couple of two-year-old sales, especially. And I think consigners were probably a little more realistic with reserves. Yeah, um, you're right. I mean, the later you get, later you get in the year, these guys don't want to be holding horses if they don't have to, They're, you know, they might in March, you might, you know, be a little more, uh, aggressive with the reserve and, and not give the horse away. Um, and you can always wheel the horse back in a sale like this one or um, the next OBS sale. But yeah. when it gets to this point of the year, it's kind of crunch time. You kind of need to reload and get ready for yearling season. So I think that's part of it. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, the middle market is the Korean buyers are typically very active in like the maybe 30 to 60 range. And they haven't, you know, been at these last few sales. And it's been, I think, positive to see that, you know, uh, American buyers have sort of stepped in for those types of horses. And a lot of the mid Atlantic guys, those are kind of like the horses that fit on the mid Atlantic circuit. Um, so I think that's been heartening to see that there's still a strong enough market. Oh, I mean, overall it's, it's, it's great that we were at, be able to get these two year old sales. in. there was, it, it was a little questionable there for a while, whether or not we didn't be able to wrap up the two year old season before the yearling sale season kicked in, that became a little bit more re realistic once basically crunched their yearling sound, sales down into one in September, but it's good for all for the consigners and the pin hookers and, and the owners that they were able to move these horses and kind of get that, uh, that cycle going again, um, you know, post Corona. So. Yeah. And Joe, the, only thing, the only thing I thought was strange and, and um, it was the first that I'd seen it was that like midway through the sale yesterday, I got a, a text and, and it went out as general text to kind of a lot of people um, from OBS that said something along the lines of um, contrary to, to the rumors, we are still holding our sale next week. Um, and, and please join us at the upcoming sale or something like, it was something like that, but it was weird. Yeah. It, was, it was almost like an Amber alert, like, Hey, don't forget that we have a sale next week. And, 
you may hear, you may have heard that we're canceling it, but we're not. So I never, never had anything like that before. Yeah, I well, think that was on Monday. Um, we'll have to ask Tom about that. Yeah. I mean, it's with what's going on in Florida right now, I think it might just be trying to reassure people that even though the state's on fire, they're right. still going to hold the sale. Uh, so it was announced, we speculated about this on last week's show, and it was announced soon after the podcast that uh, Churchill Downs is going to have uh, fans in some capacity at the Derby. Uh, they got the green light from the governor, Andy Bashir. Uh, I got to say that, you know, they were, they were, I think they were purposefully vague about what the protocol and stuff are going to be and how many fans there are. Cause I think, you know, we're far enough out from it that they can, they can adjust as they get close, as we get closer to Derby day. Uh, we're a little, a little over two months away now, but the thing that I, that really stood out to me and Brian touched on this at the sale, you know, masks have to be mandatory. Like, I'm sorry, but I didn't understand that when people are sitting down and they're eating and they're drinking and all that, you can't, uh, you can't police that kind of thing. But I didn't see anything in the announcement from Churchill that masks are going to be required to get on the ground. It says, it said, they said the masks were going to be encouraged. Now, maybe I missed that. But to me, that's something that ha you have to have one to get onto the grounds at the very least. Maybe you can't enforce it all the time, what everybody's doing. Uh, but first of all, you, you got to have, at, at most, I think, 25% capacity. Um, it's just going to be insane to have any more than that. But do not let people onto the grounds unless they have a mask. And, you know, I'm just going to go off on a little soapbox here because this is the least that, has, that could possibly be asked of you to stop a pandemic. Like, the idea that a mask, that wearing a mask, a cloth, cloth mask, has become this political football where people have to take this strong stand for their freedom to not wear a freaking mask like just put the mask on like it drives me crazy as someone who's been through this who, who has been through the epicenter of the covid crisis for months just put the goddamn mask on like it's not that big of a deal show me the thing in the constitution that says you don't have to wear a mask for the public health like that drives me absolutely crazy and if you're out there and you're not wearing a mask, you're being selfish and you're playing with other people's lives. And I just had to go off on that rant real quick because it drives me crazy that this has become like a political issue. It is so little that is being asked of you just to put a freaking mask on. Like, it's not that serious. So, Churchill, I hope that you don't let people on the grounds if they're not wearing a mask. I will hand it over to them. Well, Joe, first of all, I couldn't agree with you more on the mask thing. And I won't say any more because you really summed it up so perfectly. And maybe this is a view from the Northeast where we live, where we were went through all this. And now our states are doing well because people here have common sense and wore masks and social distancing, uh, et cetera. So back to the, the main issues here. One of the things that has to be answered, and again, Churchill was very vague on this, is, OK, a normal derby would be 150,000 people. Are there going to be 150,000 people there? No, there's not going to be. Are there going to be 5,000 people there? No, it's obviously going to be more than that. So what is that number? We have no idea. And, you know, the, the higher the number, the more the risk, et cetera. So, you know, I, I again, I, I'm obviously on the same page with you. I hope they know what they're doing because this really seems like uh, uh, an, an accident. Uh, waiting to happen. And let's, uh, you know, let's hope that it doesn't and hope that everything is safe and everybody has a great time, et cetera. And back to the mass, you were right. They did not say they're going to be mandatory. They're going to encourage people. You're a 100% right. That's total BS. You want to go into there, you got to wear a mask, et cetera. And then the other point that I'd like to make is, uh, again, it's over two months away. And I'm not entirely sure Honestly, it's going to happen the way they think it's going to happen. We see how this changes by the day. If somebody would have said three months ago that we can have a, an event in Florida with 25,000 people outdoors, they would say, great, you know what, let's go do it. Now look at it. Now Florida is turning in the other direction. Kentucky, fortunately, the numbers are good. But, you know, well, so it's going to be September 5th. We could wake up on August 15th to a front page story in the Louisville Courier Journal that, you know, the virus has spiked and is out of control in Kentucky. Let's hope that doesn't happen. But that is a possibility as well. To sum it up, I just think the whole thing makes me real nervous. It really does. I, I think they'll hopefully uh, at least be smart enough with the protocols and the limiting of fans and all that. Um, I guess we'll have to see. But it seems like they've been pretty cautious. And Churchill has done a good job with the protocols just um, up until this point. 
just with regular racing. Obviously, it's a lot different animal when it's the derby. Um, I think we can, we need to start a business making like derby masks, you know, kind of like derby hats or something. I think that could be lucrative. So we gotta we gotta figure that out at some point. Just do print a bunch of Franklin Ave masks and then like fly over the track. <laughs> I thought about getting them done. I, I need to look into that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I feel like they're pretty cheap to make. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. This is, it, I kind of compare it to the other sports that are trying to come back right now. And it just, I don't know, man. Like it's, 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 it's just to a certain point where it's not worth it, especially with the NBA. They're trying to restart in Orlando, which is now like Florida is, is, is a real COVID hotspot. Um, there's just, there's, there's players testing positive and they're talking about like, Oh, well we might start and then stop. And then we're going to have people, come, we're going to have certain people coming and go. It's just like at a certain point, it's just like cancel the season, man. It's just, I don't know. I think what, what's worrisome for a lot of leagues and for a lot of fans is that there's no guarantee that the fall in the fall, we're going to have sports back either. It might even, it might even be and God forbid a worse situation. I think if there was some kind of guarantee that the, 2020, 2021 NBA, NHL football seasons, we're going to start on time. Then I think you, you, you might see the commissioner is more willing to pull the plug on this season, but I think that we're not even looking that far ahead. So I think that that's why they're trying to squeeze these last 20 games or whatever into these seasons. But it just like, like Bill, like it really makes me nervous and it just, it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem necessary. It doesn't, as much as I love sports and much as much as I miss it and would love to be watching sports again, it's just, it's not an essential business. You know, it's just it, people, don't, people don't like literally need sports to survive. If you work in sports, then yeah. But overall, the general population doesn't need sports to survive like they need groceries. So I just, I don't know. I, w- I would kind of be erring on the side of pulling the plug on those seasons. And yeah, the Derby, we'll see. Like I said, they, they're giving themselves a lot of wiggle room for the next two months to see what happens. But I just, I, if for anyone who thinks that there's going to be definitely tens of thousands of fans Churchill Downs on the first Saturday in September, I would, I would temper your expectations because. So can, we don't can, I add, can I add something yeah. to that? You made a good point. So let's look at the other, the three major sports that are, are talking about coming back in, in baseball, hockey, and basketball. None of them are talking about having fans in the stands, none whatsoever. They're all coming up with these contingency plans. So, and now that uh, nobody will go to a Trump rally either, the Kentucky Derby on September 5th could presumably be the first mass gathering of human beings in the United. Nobody laughed at my Trump joke, by the way. Um, the <laughs> mass gathering of human beings in the United States of America. I mean, that sounds like, you know, hyperbole, but what else could you think of that would attract, you know, let's just say they have 50,000 fans, which is, you know, maybe may the kind of number they're looking at. That's still 50,000 people in a, you know, fairly enclosed environment. Um, you know, the Grand Sand is big there, but it's not like you're going to be, it's not going to be, you know, six feet apart type of thing when, you know, the people in the box next to you are, are you know, rub, almost literally rubbing elbows with you. Yeah. And I just, I don't know. It's 50,000 seems very aggressive to me, even like it's not going to be a good look, you know, regardless of whether or not there's like, there's a spike because of it. It's just, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to be the, the first one out into the wilderness with tens of thousands of people at my event. Like I, I wouldn't really want to do that, but you know, especially with the way this is going now in America, like we thought we had it controlled and just people don't act right, man. Like these, these Southern states, like we, we talked about this earlier in the podcast when we were talking about the racing schedule and how there might be starts and stops. There probably won't be now since it seems like these tracks have gotten to the point where they're allowed to have, you know, just run with, with no fans. And, and we're happy about that. But we talked about it that, you know, here in the Northeast, we went to total lockdown and in the South, they just, they weren't acting right. And in Texas and Florida, like they've opened these, they open bars and restaurants like too early. And now they're in a, in a similar position to where we were. And it just, it looks so bad. It looks, it's so embarrassing just for me right now in terms of COVID to be an American, because you talk about what's going on in, in Europe and you, you look at the, the graphs between the EU and America in terms of cases. And now the EU is, you know, banning U S travelers, like 20 different countries are banning U S travelers. And I can't blame them. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't let American travelers into my country either. We do not have this thing remotely under control the way we thought. And it's just, it's so embarrassing and such an unforced error. And you know, we hope we hope things turn around in the South, but it ain't going that way. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action. 
for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. So I wanted to touch on this just because it's been a, a, it's kind of been a lightning rod. We've run this diversity and racing series the past week on the TDN, and it's kind of gotten a lot of traction and a lot of attention on Twitter. Let me say off the top, the disclaimer off the top, four white guys talking about the problems of diversity and racing. Not a great look, but I just, you know, with that disclaimer in mind, we're still allowed to have opinions. We're still allowed to have impressions. So I just, I wanted to mention it and, you know, because I think it is necessary and I, you know, I want to give a lot of credit to Sue Finley and Katie Ritz and Bill Finley, who I think has done a really good job talking to talk to Deshaun Parker yesterday. A really good story. I talked to Angel Cordero the other day. Um, so I think you guys have all done a really good job on that. But I think, you know, the reaction, it suggests to me that people are uncomfortable even having the conversation. And I think that that makes it worthwhile that we're doing this and that the industry is starting to reckon with this because I see a lot of a lot of responses from people that are just they don't even recognize that there's a problem. And I think that having this, these kind of discussions is the it breaks the first barrier towards getting to a more equal place towards towards getting to a more level playing field, because it is ridiculous that how many black people do you know in the industry? I guarantee it's not more than a handful. And I guarantee the ones you do know are mostly not in positions of power. So I don't, I mean, unless you're saying that that's, that's meritorious, like that is what it, the way it should be, then I think you have to, you have to recognize that there's a problem here. What the solutions are, like I just, that's, that's a whole nother conversation that, you know, people smarter and more on the ground than us could, could talk about for hours. But I think the fact that people are even reacting strongly to us having the conversations shows that's a conversation worth having. Um, I'll toss it to Bill because I think he's done a good job talking to so, some, some of the few represented minorities in racing. Well, thank you, Joe. And again, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to say anything because of the four white guy thing that you brought up. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that I've learned through this um, is that I don't necessarily, again, my opinion probably doesn't count for anything, but I don't necessarily think horse racing is a racist sport. And a matter of fact, um, I, from the people I talked to, and even going back to Kendrick Carmouche, who I wrote a story about several weeks earlier, um, and, and the people that were quoted in other stories, I don't really think anybody used that word, that horse racing is racist. But the more the problem is that it hasn't done enough to try to attract minorities, uh, particularly blacks, into the sport. And, you know, how is that done I don't really have the answer to that, but that is something that horse racing needs to uh, address. And, you know, one of the reasons, frankly, and this is coming from a, you know, left wing liberal person in the, you know, in a blue state in New Jersey. Um, one of the, the problems with horse racing is that there's not enough black people involved on the lower levels of grassroots that then could be promoted to higher positions. Uh, it's as if the the, the culture of, of African Americans in, in this country really just doesn't tune into horse racing. So how do you get people involved? How do you get them into you know uh, uh, a good middle executive level job when they come out of college at at twenty three, twenty four years old, where they may only be making fifty, sixty grand, but then they can be uh, ten years later can be head of the New York Racing Association. That's what racing really has to focus on: is getting people. Uh, particularly blacks, but uh, also Hispanics, but there is there are tons of Hispanics on the racetrack between the jockeys and the backstretch workers. So I think more of the focus would be on black people. How would you get them interested in the sport? How would you get them into entry level jobs? And then you can have a talent pool that can be promoted through the ranks right now. So you know there, the problem is not that black people are not getting promoted to higher positions. The problem is that black people aren't invested in this sport. And, uh, you know, I, I don't see a whole lot of fans out there. You don't see any on the backstretch when it used to be 25, 30 years ago, all blacks and African-Americans on the backstretch. And then the uh, 
and then you don't see any, with very few exceptions, in, in key executive jobs. So I think that's again, you know, my opinion doesn't count for anything, but I think that's how Racy needs to tackle this: is how do you get them involved, the minorities involved? You would include women, Asians as well, and then bring them up through the ranks into higher ranking jobs, so that you know, uh, ten years from now the top 25 executives in horse racing, seven of them are minorities. Uh, right now, I think the list is one, uh, Jason Wilson from Equibase, and that's it. Yeah, and uh, to mention Jason Wilson, I thought his piece, I think he had the first uh, piece in that series, and I thought that was a really good, interesting um, take on, on things, and he's obviously just like a brilliant guy. Um, I was trying to think of ways to frame this, just like you know, like everyone else said, we're probably not the experts on this topic. Um, I was thinking back, I was uh, growing up, I played hockey, um, played with thousands of kids. And I can think of maybe three people of color I ever played with. And now you look at the NHL and it has gotten a bit more diverse. There are, you know, a significant number of people of color playing hockey. Uh, and they're probably maybe like 10 years younger. It's scary to think that, but maybe 10 years younger than I was. And the one thing that, that I will say also is that we as an industry have not been proactive in promoting. Um, the sport or promoting opportunities to minorities, um, whether it's it's people of color or or women for that matter. Um, if you look at for perfect example of of the old boys network, um, you know in the industry, you look at the Breeders Cup, and if I said the names, you know Beck Bell, uh, Clay Farish, Han, you know Hancock, uh, Lister, you know look at Sam. So the list kind of goes goes on and on. But it's the same group of it's the same families that were in charge of the Breeders' Cup when it started 30 plus years ago as it is today. It's just a different generation of that family. So the, the, the network, the infrastructure hasn't changed. And until you, know, you get prominent candidates for positions of power, like Bill said before, um, into some of these, you know, get them onto some of these board of directors or um, you know, spheres of influence, um, nothing's going to change. Now, how do you get that? How do you how do you get p candidates to be eligible for those positions? Well, I'm going to pick on the Breeders' Cup for a second because I've been in the industry for for almost 40 years. They just had their election. You know, we go to every sale, we race at basically every racetrack and jurisdiction in the country. We have you know um, rights to stallions and things like that. I didn't know what the process was as far as even getting on the ballot. I mean, it's almost that kind of a of a wink, wink, nod, nod, you know, back room type type situation. They have of the 42 members who are in power, you know, between members and, and directors, there's four women and that's it. Now, again, you can say maybe there's not a lot of candidates, but I can think of a half a dozen um, consigners that are women that women owned. And we've highlighted a couple of them, you know, through this piece and at the TDN um, that would be great candidates for things like the Breeders' Cup um, or other, you know, boards that, that are in, in positions of power. So I think that that as an industry, we have to recognize that it's not just, you know, it's not just an easy answer of, well, there's just not a lot of candidates out there. There are a lot of candidates out there, but the people who are in positions of power have to recognize that they want to expand and broaden their horizons. And until that happens, nothing really is going to change, you know, in certain parts of the industry. Um, from a racing standpoint, we look at, uh, you know, we look at trainers and at least there are some prominent women trainers that are coming up through the ranks and, and we can go through them later on. You have Linda Rice and Brittany Russell and Lacey Gaudet. Um, you know, and so, so at least that looks like that's starting to blossom and, and have some opportunities there. But for the most part, unless the powers that be in where the money is in, in, on the breeding side, unless they, they open up and, and give themselves other opportunities, nothing's going to change there. Yeah, I think the point you made is right about about legacy. Le horse racing is a legacy sport, which is on one hand great because it it, it guarantees that the sport lives on through f future generations. But I think it also becomes I don't know a legacy of exclusivity. I think too much in racing. A lot more to be said about that, you know, by people you know smarter and more involved than we are. But you know, I I, I think it's a great thing. It's a great thing, conversation that that people are starting to have, and it's going to make some people uncomfortable. But that's how you get progress. I just wanted to mention um, for another, actually another podcast on this subject. I thought Jonathan Kinchin, I think it was last week on his podcast, kind of talked about all this stuff. Um, and it was really interesting. And I think it's definitely worth a listen. Yeah. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the urban industry. 
With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more how they can help you at www.greenco.com. Our Green Group Guest of the Week this week is the president of OBS Sales, Tom Ventura. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad to be here. It's good to have you. So I wanted to have, we wanted to have you on. You guys were kind of the last out of the pool when it comes to pre-corona sales. And you were the first back into the pool last week, um, a couple of weeks ago with the OBS June sale. We asked this question of Lewis Sella when we had him on at Oakland Park and they were pretty much the only track still running. What kind of lessons have you guys learned? What kind of protocols have you had? It might be the online bidding. What kind of lessons have you learned from this, you know, unorthodox process that you think can help the sales industry at large going forward? Well, one of the things that we learned real quickly that you had to uh, be pretty flexible and be able to adapt on the fly. You know, there were restrictions coming down the pike, um, literally as we were about to hold the March sale. And the different parts of the country were being impacted at different levels. And one thing that was unique for us is that with the two-year-old sale, these horses are on the ground for an extended period of time. And they were here, you know, for 10 days, really before anything was becoming uh, an issue in terms of the, uh, the pandemic. And we had buyers here. We had people doing their scouting work here. You know, so we knew as we were approaching the sale that a lot of the homework was done. And uh, unless something changed, we really wanted to try and, and have the sale for multiple reasons. You know, one you know, we needed to have the sales so people can sell some horses and people can buy horses. And two, um, everything was in place and it wasn't like we were waiting on uh, a lot of our clients to show up to buy horses. So as things were tightening up, it became very um, hectic, almost on a, you know, an hourly basis as things were, were being changed. And, you know, so we met with the local government officials and the uh, got the advice from you know, at the state level what sort of things uh, were being required and and what we could do and and it was still kind of feel your own way because there wasn't a lot of um, dramatic restrictions that were being put in place but there were restrictions being being done and so ultimately we had, we met with the sellers and, and the buyers and talked to them and and made sure that we did all we could on our end to protect everybody that were here. And try to have the sale, and um, I think we did a good job in terms of, uh, of of having the sale and protecting everybody that was here. And we're on 250 acres. Um, there's a lot of space, open space, where you can be socially distant except during the actual sale itself. And so, at that point, we decided to keep all the interior doors open, have doors and open the doors, kind of eliminating some of the touch points um, as people would come into the building and have the sanitizer stations. You know, at that point, you know, there were masks weren't really thought to be um, necessary. It, whether you were asymptomatic or symptomatic, all this stuff was still evolving. And it still is, quite frankly, it still is evolving as far as what is the, the true cause of it. But ultimately, we thought that, you know, that the sale went well, um, considering the circumstances and people were able to, to get business done. And uh, for that sale, we had uh, just in, ramped up our phone bidding. We had probably six phones instead of two phones that were available for phone bidding. Um, quite frankly, there wasn't that much more activity on the phone. You know, many of the, the buyers or their agents were already on the ground. So they, they were there and they did a lot of the communication directly. And so while there were phone bids with the principal and the agent talking to one another, it wasn't phone bids that OBS was handling. So um, that, was, that was our first step to get through March. Um, and then um, as we had to, had to ramp back up for June, we, um, we put the online bidding into overdrive. That was, that was in in play in terms of something that we wanted to get to get done, but it got moved to the head of the class real quick. And um, I really have to uh, appreciate the work that Xira did that, that 
it's doing our online bidding because you know from OBS's perspective, it's it's obviously a um, high, super high priority for us, and we were able and willing to work twenty four seven to get it up and running for the uh, spring sale. And, and fortunately, Xira jumped in right there with us to get it up. Now it 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 worked. I thought it was very good. It's not doesn't have all the bells and whistles that it will down the road, but it it certainly does. Bill, yeah, hi Tom. Thanks for joining us. And you mentioned something about the internet bidding, and I want to keep that conversation going. Uh, this has come about because of the pandemic. It's not just you guys. Every sale has added internet bidding as a uh, component of it. And we're even seeing uh, several sales now that are internet only, new companies coming in, trying to get their foot in the door so far as internet sales. So come 2021, hopefully the pandemic is behind us. We get back to normal. How much do you think now this is going to be part of sales going forward? I think it's uh, it's here to stay in terms of having an online bidding uh, option. You know, I think ultimately we sell horses and horses have to be looked at. And, and Veterinarians have to scope the horses. Somebody has to look at the physical horse, whether it's the principal or, or one of their advisors, has to look at the horse and pass that information on. So I, I don't see it as, as being a replacement. There's, there's certainly going to be uh, a need to have the live auction. It's just an added tool for the live, live auction. So there may be a time uh, when uh, the, the buyer wants to bid uh, and have full control of that bid and maybe doesn't need to talk to um, anyone else and just wants to bid and at the click of a mouse, they can bid on the horse. So um, so I think that, that part of it's going to be here to stay. And then there'll be other types of uh, online bidding uh, options that probably will come into play and get a little more, uh, little more traction. You do see a lot of different uh, timed bids to come up, but I think as, as far as the, uh, as, as our uh, normal auction process will include online bidding from here, here on forward. And, and we'll enhance it in terms of things that the, the bidders and the buyers like to see. And, and ours was pretty user-friendly in terms of getting that information to them in a timely fashion. Um, before the, the pandemic hit, um, it, you guys were in communication with FASIG and Keeneland about drug testing and implementing uh, new testing and, and basically a, a new um, series of rules and regulations to help protect the athletes. Um, and I know, you know, we in particular and other owners in the industry applauded that, op that, that, that change of, uh, of protocol. What was the genesis behind that? You know, cause it's so hard to get the sales companies to agree on anything. And yet it seemed like that the three major sales companies all got together and stood up that, we need to have some additional protection. Well, the sales companies, you know, we're competing for the best horses and the best buyers, and we're, we're doing all that. But at the same time, we realize as a group that we need to have some common framework so that a person that goes from one sale to the next sale, they're dealing with, you know, the same rules for the most part as, as they do um, from, from each place. So, and it's not the first time that we've worked together um, from a medication standpoint, you know, several years years back, we we uh, inputted the ban of anabolic steroids, um, and then we did the uh, bisphosphonates uh, recently. And and moving forward, you know, we we always have these conversations as a group, um, not only on a on a domestic level, but internationally, we meet uh, as a group with CETA uh, that brings in the uh, European and the Australian and some of the other other auction companies to, to see what we can do to kind of present our product in a similar fashion and protect the buyers and the sellers. Tom, uh, there was an interesting story this week about this $1.1 million Spitzer Colt that was turned back uh, that Larry Best had bought at the last sale. Can you talk about kind of what happened there? And in a general sense, what percentage of horses would you say that, that after a sale, uh, you know, is there a dispute on? Uh, the answer to the last question, it's a very small percentage um, that there really are, are problems that ultimately end up in a return. Um, years ago, the, before the repository, and, and OBS was one of the last sales companies on board with the full-blown repository system where, you know, you look at 
x-rays and you get what you get. Um, we had a bone warranty in place. And um, if someone found a, an issue with a, with a radiograph uh, that they took post-sale, they would present it to us for return. We would put it in front of the consigner I would agree or disagree with this, with the uh, buyer's opinion. And then if there was a disagreement, it would go to a panel. And then that ultimately the veterinary panel would have that final call. Probably um, one of the most famous uh, horses that we sold that had an issue was Skip Away. Uh, Skip Away had a uh, chip in his ankle of when he breathed. And post-sale, uh, the veterinarian uh, found a chip in the ankle. Uh, presented it to the seller. The seller ha had done business with that uh, person before, but they didn't even uh, choose to have a, a veterinarian review the information and said they'd take the horse back. And so uh, as we're in the middle of, of voiding that sale, uh, Sonny Hine called the, uh, the seller and said, you know what, I, I really like that horse. I'd like to keep him. But instead of 30000 will you let me buy him for twenty two five? I think the number was. $7,500 discount for the ankle chip and for the layup time and the time off that he might need, uh, rehab time. And they came to terms and, and that's what ended up happening. And uh, long story short, you know, he made $9.9 .9 million with the chip in his ankle because it never, um, you know, that's a little back part, but in terms of, uh, you know, conditions of sale, there's certain things that are in place that, um, that protect the buyer and, and in fairness to the seller, it can't be all encompassing. And so uh, one of the issues is cribbing and cribbing is a little bit unique in that that is one of the few warranties that, that continue on beyond the sale and beyond the time the horse leaves the grounds. So in, in this particular instance, it's a seven day warranty that if a horse shows signs of cribbing, that he may is subject to return um, would go through the same process if the consigner um, is disputing that he's a cribber and maybe he's just a chewing chewing on stuff. They could uh, they could contest that, but in this case, it was fairly straightforward. That on the seventh day, we got a report um, that we got a video uh, of that, passed it along to the consigner. The consigner and the buyer had had conversations actually. Before with us and um you know so uh larry best had the option to return the horse and uh ultimately that's what happened so it's it's one of those things that's unfortunate uh you know hopefully the horse uh can continue on and, and in the big picture cribbing is an issue that's covered by warranty but um john you race a lot of horses if, if you had a choice of a lot of problems that horses develop Cribbing wouldn't be very high up on the totem pole in terms of career, you know, career threatening. And um, but it's certainly an option that, uh, you know, that one could choose to return the horse. And when you pay a million dollars for a horse and you, you don't want it, you know, that's certainly their call. And, you know, maybe uh, you know, they couldn't work out or anything else. Um, so we just move on. You hope the horse can run well for the people that, uh, that took it back. And. Hopefully Larry comes on and buys, buys something else from us. Yeah, Tom, my, my grandfather used to always tell me a story that, it, uh, you know, a deal isn't done until the, the check clears and the bank opens the next day. And I'm sure you look at it as a, uh, the sale's not over until seven days after the, uh, after the, the final hammer goes down, right? Yeah, so cribbing, um, there's also, if the horse has a neurologic issue, is another one that extends beyond uh, the, the time, has a seven day uh, window. I think the other sales companies actually have a shorter time frame on cribbing. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what they are, but I, I know it's less than a week. And uh, but whatever it is, that's that's how it turned out. And uh, you know, now we'll just move forward and on to the next dance. Yep. Um, my, my other question for you is: over the years, OBS has evolved not only in size, um, you know, but but also in in the number of horses and the types of sales that you guys have. Have offered and, and what I mean by that is I remember not so long ago when you guys had a February two-year-old sale and a March two-year-old sale and the April sale was was kind of for the non-select horses that were left over and now things have evolved where you have the March sale and the April sale is your largest and and some could say your your best sale or best opportunity to buy top horses at least 
Do you foresee that changing down the road? You know, again, post Corona, let's assume that we have a normal year. Do you anticipate that the two sales, the March and the April sale will be your staples going forward? Or do you think that eventually um, you may evolve into, you know, an earlier sale uh, or maybe make the June sale more robust? I think, um, you know, the June sale actually has made a lot of progress in the last several years. And so if you go back when we had the sale in Miami in February and the sales here in, in March and April, um, the April sale was was one in which that the consigners of horses that were deemed to be their high end horses, they were a little hesitant to go in those sales because they wanted to be in a quote unquote select sale. And, time, and that has evolved because what, what ends up happening is the, um, the buyers like the opportunity to review you know, a lot of horses. So when, when, when it, the horses, the sales were shrinking to 200 horses, um, maybe it doesn't motivate you or, or some other people to come down to Ocala to go through a 200 horse sale and maybe get outrun on the top 10 that you may like. So, so the, the, the numbers benefited April. And then as April became more and more popular in terms of uh, to, to the buyers with a wide uh, variety of price points. And then you had horses like, you know, Silver Charm come out of April and just, the runners really kind of pushed that sale to the next level. And now that sale has really grown to where, you know, I always tell Todd, uh, our, our director of sales, I said, you know, it's not our grandfather's April sale anymore. You know, it's now, now we're almost in the reverse mode sometimes to say, hey, this horse looks precocious. Why don't you put it in the March sale? Said, no, we'll wait till April. We, we, we have six horses. If we have two to put in March, we'll just rather just put all six in April and gives them a little more leeway. The other thing in the, on the racing side of things, you know, you don't have a lot of early two-year-old races like you did in the past. Um, so giving them a little extra time helps. And I think our June sale has really benefited where, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it would be considered um, a le the leftovers, you know, the horses that, you know, for some reason or another couldn't make the early sales. And, and now that, that has changed dramatically. If you just need to flip through our catalog for this sale, we have a thousand horses in the main book, another hundred horses. Granted, it's a different year, so it, it might not look quite the same it has in the past, but. You know, last June, we had over a 1,000 horses. Golden Sense came out of this sale. He won the Breeders' Cup mile back to back. So it, it's making progress. And, uh, you know, I think ultimately the sellers of the horses feel very comfortable at any three of our sales. In order to give the horses the proper time to show their stuff, you know, whether it's March, April, or June, I think moving forward, they're very comfortable in either spot. Um. Tom, obviously the phasic results were probably a little better than people might have expected. Um, what do you, are you kind of expecting similar for for your next sale? And then heading into the yearling market, how much do you think um, some of the struggles of the pin hookers will affect the yearling market? Well, that's a you know that's a good question and one that you know I don't have a lot of confidence you know really responding to because of, you know we we we're taking it day by day and and the our sale and, and the basic Pipton sale, you know, had horses in the, in our sales that, that weren't intended to be in those sales. So the, the numbers really, it's not apples to apples. Um, I think the, the June sale, we'll get a real true test of the depth of the market. We have another thousand horses on the market. One thing that's missing this year is the participation of, you know, some of the international buyers, especially the South Korean buyers. They, they buy, you know, volume, you know, they'll buy a hundred horses a year or more. And they certainly help that, you know, 30 to a hundred thousand dollar price range to keep it, uh, keep it moving. Um, and I'm hopeful. And you know, I think based on our sale and the phase of Kipton sale, they held up pretty well comparatively and they had a, a lot of participation, uh, certainly, uh, the U S based. And I think the other thing that's going to be benefit us now um, it helped us, I think, in April, and it's going to help us more here, is that all the racetracks, for the most part, are up and running. Um, a lot of the, um, the slot machines and historical racing venues, those need to get on board to help fund some of the purses and the Breeders' Awards. But I think, you know, there's a positive frame of mind 
now compared to March as we were just in the beginning of, of this as, in, as things were shutting down, where now things are opening up more and more. You have the owners finally getting a chance to go to the race to the racetrack and, and watch their horses. You know, it's it's nice to watch them on TV, but you know, uh, you you drive to the Monmouth to watch your horses run, uh, albeit you're not going to have forty thousand people in the stands on Haskell Day. You know, there's there's a feel to that that you enjoy. Um, you know, in Saratoga and Del Mar, it's going to be different without you know big crowds, and hopefully at some point they'll allow people in there. And then the Keeneland meet, short meet, and, and, and some people will show up. But I think all those things are positive from the you know the horse industry side of things, outside influence, who, who knows, you know, really which direction we're going, but the financial markets have seemed to hold up uh, relatively well in this scenario. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As The Green Group Guest of the Week, Tom Ventura will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. So we had our little fantasy draft a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, however long it was, time all blends together right now. Um, but we, so we each pick four horses and we're going to accumulate points throughout the season and see who wins at the end, just as a way to spice up the three-year-old uh, derby chase. Problem is we lost a bunch of horses pretty much right off the bat with that. We lost Nadal, we lost Charlatan, I lost Wells Bayou. I think there were one or two others that, that dropped it off soon after that. So Rather than have empty stalls in our fantasy stable, we're all going to go around and pick one supplemental horse to add to our stable. Um, so some of us will have four, some of us will have five total, but just to make it a little bit more interesting and have more horses to root for, we're going to go in order from worst to first right now, which the, the way the standings are, John is in last, then Bill, then Al, then me, and Brian is currently in the lead. Uh, so John, we'll start off with you. Who is your sub? Well, before we get to my supplemental pick, um, Brian, the, are we trading again? No more trades. No, no. All right. <laughs> so so I, I handicapped this pretty hard last night because I am in last place. I did such a bad job, you know, first out of the gate by picking, you know, I thought it was a safe one, Maxfield. Um, so I was looking at, do you pick a, a, a horse that's already proven like Tap It to Win, who had a bad race in the, uh, you know, in the Belmont, uh, or do you pick an up and comer? Um, or do you pick the expensive horse, the $3.65 million horse that, that Baffert has, Cezanne, who just broke his, broke his maiden? Um, I'm going to go in a different direction, though, because I have to go big or go home. And one of the biggest horses that's remaining um, physically as well as potential-wise is Uncle Chuck. So I'm going to go with Uncle Chuck, the uh, Uncle Mo, 1,300-pound Uncle Mo colt that's going to be running, hopefully, in the Los Alamos Derby this weekend. Wow. All right, I'm up. I, here's a suggestion for next year to make this much more interesting. No one's allowed to pick a Baffert horse. How about that as a new ranker? <laughs> <laughs> then we'd all There's be saying, scattered, right? took Charlotte in. Yeah, right. All right, um, well, you took Uncle Chuck. I'll take the other Baffert one. Running an allowance race at Los Alamitos this week, $3.65 million, joins the Finley Racing Stable, Cezanne. All right, so... Two Baffert horses off the board. There's going to be another Baffert horse off the board now because Al, who is on vacation, graciously sent me his picks. He's going to take Thousand Words, who was one of the early early contenders for the Derby and, and kind of dropped off, is coming back now and I think is also going to run in the Los Alamitos Derby this week. So Al takes Thousand Words, three Baffert horses off the board. I'm going to go in a different direction. Um, this is a horse who I think is a little bit under the radar because of his connections, but he's run two monster races so far this year. And that is a horse named Art Collector, who ran at Churchill a little while ago and went wire to wire, dominated the field, had a hundred buyer, 
trainer is Tom Drury, who I think is, is one of the more underrated trainers in the country. He always, he's always up upwards of 25% of Keeneland and Churchill and Turfway. So I think he's really interesting. He was, he used to be a turf horse for Joe Sharp. He switched to the dirt, had like a huge, huge race. I think ran like a negative one and a half thoroughgraph and it's really backed it up in the two races since so far this year. So our collector for me, Ryan, it's yours. I want to say I'm doing this under protest as a, uh, after my, very stellar draft in my two, three, four finish in the Belmont. Um, I guess we'll, we'll make it a little more interesting. Uh, I won't pick Harvey's little Goyle. So I'm between two <laughs> lightly raced horses here. Um, I'm going to go with money moves. He's a Pletcher. I think he's like two for two expensive horse. I think he was in the Derby future pool. So I assume he's like, I think he's working towards a return. I don't know. I don't need really need a fifth. So. I'll just take Ooh. it. <laughs> Look at you. I, I thought about I thought about refusing to take it and just saying I don't need it, but right. I'll take it. So that's gonna do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. Remember, wagering through Keeneland Select benefits the thoroughbred industry, profits are reinvested back into the game. Sign up at KeenelandSelect.com. I want to thank Lieutenant Colonel Bill Finley, John Green, Ryan DiDonato, our producer Patty Wolf. Our editors, Anthony LaRocca and Danny DeCypher, and our production coordinator, Michelle Sabrino. Wear a mask, be safe. We'll see you next week. <laughs>